The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. And it's really fun to be bringing this particular section of the first movement of Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique to you to study today. It's, it's actually rather funny. If you have watched the San Francisco Symphony Keeping Score episode, which shows Michael Tilson Thomas conducting this particular passage as if he were sort of heaving sacks of flour around or maybe fighting a very small sword fight with a small opponent. Well, it's actually expressing perhaps some passion on the part of the composer. As we recall, these are reveries and passions. Remember how I was mentioning that getting past the repeat meant that the Sonata Allegro form of this piece was moving from its opening key of C major, uh, once you got past the introduction, the C major of the E day fix, if that is the beginning of this movement, the official beginning, and modulating to G. And then very quickly, Berlioz came back to C major, as we see here at Rehearsal S. Okay, well, he's not going to end up just sticking around in C for the rest of this movement, which has got quite a few more minutes to go. So he's going to play some games, and a lot of this is just math. Okay, so I'm going to explain some of the mathematics of what's going on here. It's, it's very, very simple math, but it's the kind of application of those calculations in chromatic motion that can end up with a really fascinating and effective passage. But first, I'm just going to explain what is going on here in terms of orchestration before I get into all that. We've got a row of chromatically ascending and descending chords here, all in staccato, which has this really, you know, shuff, 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 shuff kind of a sound. And we've got the crescendo built into it, which really increases and then decreases the tension, the sense of tension. And you know, perhaps this is symbolizing, remember I said passion just a few minutes ago, anticipation, right, or longing, or perhaps Berlioz running from performance to performance of Harriet Smithson, and just desperately trying to figure out everything about her. As these chords get to the top here, we get these octaves on top, then resolving, and notice that the dynamics here are forte to the fortissimo of the strings. Now this is an early attempt to balance, something that is I would say unique to Berlioz, but certainly he was the first to use it in a sort of a professional, realistic sense. He knew that the instruments couldn't be as loud as one another, or they couldn't be marked the same way if it was going to be easy for the conductor to balance everything. So this is an example of that. Realizing that with these staccato chords, the staccato itself also reduces the projection of the chord, it would be necessary to pull back just a little bit, especially with these horns, right? So the winds and horns are balanced together to be just a little bit under the strings, or to be a little bit under their perception of what fortissimo is, so that they will balance with the fortissimo of the strings. And notice that they tail off to piano quite a bit before the strings do. So by the time the strings get to about right here, they are about mezzo piano, or maybe mezzo forte. Let's say mezzo forte. So it's still a way of sort of swallowing the resolution 
of the winds into the strings. What is going on in terms of our math problem? Okay. All right, well, this is actually quite fun. We're starting off in C major. Notice the voicing of this chord. We have got all the violins, firsts and seconds, playing the same top note of the chord. All right, and that just continues on and continues on. We've got the violas playing down a fourth from that, starting off with the simplest chord, C, and then down a fourth is G. Now, this is kind of fun. Down a tenth is E. So the cellos are playing the median of a C major chord almost two octaves below the tonic, right? So the violins are always playing the tonic with, let's say, a standard orchestra, like 30 players. 30 players are playing that tonic, and then, say, maybe 14, 12 violas are playing the dominant, and the cellos are playing the median, say, maybe 10 cellos or so. The cellos and the violas are going to be balanced with each other, and that tonic above is going to just really ring out. It's going to be very powerful. But it will balance all the same just because of the distance of this mediant from the rest of the chord. The dominant is not as crucial. It's something that will be inferred inside the position of this voicing. And notice that that mediant comes in an octave lower with the double basses. Here's an example of Berlioz scoring for an independent bass section, which is something I have not really brought up yet. There's so many pieces, even with Beethoven having the occasional independent bass line, but so many pieces up to this point basically just had cellos and double basses on the same staff, and we've even seen an example of that in previous screens, in previous lectures of this particular piece. But here we're seeing that the double basses really are fully independent, right? Of course, this might have been achieved by just saying con bassi, like right on this note, and had senza bassi right here, and then just left out this staff. But it's easier on the conductor, really. A lot of this is for the convenience of the conductor as well as for just clarity for the players, and easier on the copyist, too, to extract this part without having to write senza and con for the bossy everywhere else on the staff. But I mean, it's really no big hassle for a copyist so long as the composer and the engraver have been clear. We're starting off with C major in that strange 6-3 inversion, right? So you've got the mediant on the bottom, then the dominant, and then the tonic on top. This is moving all the way up here to what is essentially an E flat chord, right? And when it hits this E flat, we get E flat in the winds. Now let's talk about the transpositions really quick and the doubling. So you have unison flutes on top. Once again, I just want to point out to people, unis, right, unison is not right to use on brass and winds, but for some reason, it was used in this particular engraving, and I have seen it almost nowhere else. But that might have been the engraving style of this publisher, but don't you use it, all right? Nobody uses unison for saying A2 or A4 or whatever in wind and brass parts, so don't do it. In fact, it sort of gives me mental hiccups to see it here in the score, but for me to replace it with A2 when I was preparing these screens would have just been way too much work. It's enough that you should see it, that this mistake was in this edition and remark on it and avoid it yourself, okay? So please do avoid saying unison on flutes, oboes, winds, brass, right? Just don't say unison when you mean A2. So A2 flutes, doubling with the first oboe, and then the second oboe is doubling unison clarinets. So we have three on each, right? Then an octave lower, 
We've got first bassoon, an octave below that, we have got second bassoon. So that is how the winds are all sitting. Now as to that second bassoon, it is being doubled by unison, by A2 E flat horns. So remember down a major sixth from C is E flat, right? So very, very easy for this player to double that note. And then that note is being doubled even more, right, by the same exact pitch sounding down an octave from written here in the C horns. So that actually makes the second bassoon kind of the odd man out. They are the only person playing this pitch down here. But the force of the E flats from all the other players, including our first violins, will make their job not quite so lonely down there, at least right at the beginning. And here, the E-flat horn players relax down to a B, and this B is going to be a lip-corrected 7th harmonic, which would normally be a slightly out-of-tune B-flat, but it's really easy to manipulate that particular tone. And this, of course, is really easy going from E-flat to D. You know, once you get above C in the staff with any natural horn, it's pretty easy to correct pitches by lip and change them around and do little things in there. Okay, so things are relaxing from an E-flat to a D. And when you get to the D, what chord is happening in the strings? Well, we have this lovely little G chord. So things line up, right? So like I said, it's math. Descending from E flat, remember that the top note of every one of these chords in the strings is the tonic, right? So we can just call it by its name that we see being played by the violins. Descending these eight half steps, we end up on a G, and the dominant of that G is D, right? So it all kind of agrees, this whole going down a half step and ending on this. And of course, it fits with the drama of the music, doesn't it? Right, we're just relaxing down to a G, and the G, we're, we're talking about math here, right? The G is the five of the C that we started on. It's just kind of like a little math trick. Now, Berlioz isn't finished yet, so he kind of reverses one step in his descending arc. He ascends for just one second and then goes back down again so he can do another one of these mathematical tricks. Now this is the same exact trick for all the instruments except it is up a half step which is why he did this little notch here so that he would end up on C sharp. So this is C sharp major instead of C major. Now here of course he writes F natural instead of E sharp because he's just thinking about the lines, each separate line for each separate player. But it really should be E sharp here if that is going to be a C sharp major chord. And the same thing here, it really could easily have been a D flat, but he didn't want to go D, D flat, D, right? He wanted to have the player have the sense of going down a half step rather than correcting a half step. Do you see what I'm saying? Down a half step to the next named pitch rather than correcting the previous pitch to a flat and then back again to a natural. It's just easier to read. Now notice the harmonic relationship here. C sharp to F is up a major third and harmonically, whereas back here C to E flat was up a minor third, but that's just because we're not thinking about the the second note of the bar, right? The second note of the bar here in this mathematical calculation was a C. So if we just look here at D major, so up a minor third from D, we get our F. So same exact thing here. Everything is the same in terms of the position, the voicing of this big old quadruple octave. And we get the same thing F relaxing down a half step to E, F major in the strings going down to an A chord. All right, so the E is the fifth of the A, just as the D was the fifth of the G. And if we we're talking about relationships here, the relationship of this A major to the D major on the second step here remains going up to the five. 
I normally don't get into harmony like this and worry about all of these different little details, but I just really thought it was worth pointing out because that's, to me, what's worth discussing about this big passage. Now, he starts off the same exact idea here. We've got an E chord going up to G major. We're talking about the second step here, not the first step. The E chord goes up to G major, and we've got this big octave G, and going all the way up to G on the first bassoon, you'll notice that Berlioz really scores fearlessly for his first bassoon player, and that's because the French bassoon has always been a bit more capable of playing higher notes. And that may also be the reason why the opening of the Rite of Spring is so fearlessly high is that Stravinsky, after a year of working with the players of the ballet orchestras that they put together in Paris, just really knew what the bassoonists were capable of. So here we're going G relaxing to F sharp, and that is interpreted sounding down an octave by our C horns. And here we've got E going to E flat rather than going to D sharp. It's probably a practical thing the horn player would be thinking about a lip correction here in order to get the pitch to bend down a little bit from the E that they were playing. So it's just more correct in terms of their perception. Now here, the C horns are starting to fill in some of these lower positions. And it's interesting how they come in one beat early supporting the G right in here, down a couple of octaves. So this is going to be sounding down an octave, right? So it'll be an octave below this G here. And it really does apply some force to the apex of this gesture. So we're going to A flat, coming back to G, that's all very easy on natural horn. And right here, this might be a stop note just stopping the G and then having it push up a half step and then coming back down. And then, of course, we're just getting higher and higher with our bassoons, as I mentioned before, and all the doubling is in the same proportions. Except, notice that as the flutes have been climbing higher and higher, the oboe just basically steps out because you can't really push your first oboe player up into the stratosphere like that without consequences. Some of these notes are technically playable on oboe, but they're not pleasant and they don't sound great, and there's no point in asking for that. So the two oboes and the two clarinets are now all playing together, <laughs> quadrupling on that pitch. The flutes are just taking these top notes, and the bassoons and horns are basically doubling on these octaves by the time you get to here. And it's just all transposing down a major sixth so that you have the same pitches down an octave as the C horn, and then the first C horn here. Okay, so what's going on here mathematically? All right, well, we're getting to the G, the same tonic note as the top of this chord, tonic G major. Now notice, Berlioz is showing that he can pull off the same trick in a slightly different harmonic context within one bar as well as within two, as we saw on the previous screen. So here, we're just relaxing down a half step, this G to this F sharp, and we're going from a G chord to a D sharp major chord. So in D sharp major, F sharp is the median, right? So instead of relaxing down a half step to the dominant within two bars, it's relaxing down a half step to the median in one bar. Once again, a math trick, right? And then climbing up here chromatically. Now we have a slight cheat here so that Berlioz can push things higher, okay? Do you see where that cheat is? Well, we were going down chromatically, half steps all the way down to D-sharp, and then on the way up, we go up a whole step. So that's the cheat right in there. Just so that Berlioz can amp things up to an A-flat, and then relax down to an E chord. 
this E chord right in here is actually a minor chord. So what happened with that? <laughs> well, the honest truth is that the cellos have been cheating a little bit too. So starting here, F sharp to G is a half step, but then of course G to A is a whole step, and A to B is a whole step, and so on. So he's playing with the context here of these lower notes so that we end up with the median being a minor right down here. Okay, and there's just a little bit of messing around right in here so that we can get to this lovely B flat chord right in here. Now, it's essentially a B flat major seventh chord. Major sevenths are chords that you usually see in music of this period that are trying to create dramatic tension. Here's your major seventh, this A, right? And the voicing of the chord is rather peculiar. We have B flat, F, and D, right? The same as before, but with the A sitting right under that B flat. And this A is going to be a note that all the other little gestures come back to over and over again. These little two note gestures climbing higher and higher chromatically. Now notice this O, right? This is an O, this is not a harmonic circle, right? This means just open. Now Berlioz or his copyists did not need to write this over every single note, but maybe Berlioz was just being obsessive and saying, you really have to make sure you don't use a fingered note here. I want this to be the open string. So yeah, I mean, that is an open A on the viola, just as that is an open A on the cello. So the players would probably do that anyway, is considering how this passage just gets higher and higher and higher. And since the A string is the highest note of both instruments, then they are just fingering the note and then letting go. It's almost like hammering on, uh, except like the hammering on isn't creating the attack of the pitch, but just the player is playing on their A string and they're just getting higher and higher and then lifting off and then bowing the open string and then fingering the next note up and then lifting off and bowing the open string and so on and so forth. Now here, of course, this A cannot be an open note, but Berlioz is being very considerate of his string players. Keep in mind that he was a guitarist, so he would know a lot about finger positions, and perhaps be even more cautious as he was dealing with tuning in fourths rather than in fifths. So here, the player can play all of these notes on the E string, fingering in second position, with the first finger stopping the A and then just adding pitches above it, but when they get too far apart, he just turns that into an open A. And there's no need for him to write the open sign over this because it is obvious that that would be what is going to happen. The same as for these double stops here. It's just obvious that the lower note is going to be an open A. And in fact, why not have this enormously stretched apart double stop two octaves apart from A to A because you have this open A down here and it doesn't really matter whether or not it's fingered or whether or not these pitches are really, really far apart. If you're playing very, very loudly, of course the notes are not in balance with a very high fingered note and an open string on the next string over. They are not balanced necessarily, but the fortissimo and the context in the tutti means that the audience will not hear it. And of course, having the whole section behind you. And then similar here, the E right up here, an octave higher than the open string, but still hitting the open A string. Somehow or other, he is intending to end up on an A major chord. And that's what he does, an A seventh chord. And in fact, the seventh of the chord is being played very loudly by our E flat horns. What's down a major sixth from E is G. G is the seventh of the A seventh chord. And then of course we've got just this wonderful voicing. This is one of those chords I would love to take apart in one of my tutti chord examinations. But I think it's pretty obvious. You know, you've got your A third here, you've got the median below just like we have had for all of these other chords, making it essentially a six three chord and then we've got the A and the E here, and we've got 
G and A stuck together up here. We've got an A fifth from the oboes. We've got these same G seconds in our B flat clarinets. You are keeping track of the B flat clarinets sounding down a whole step, right? And then of course the mediant from below is being supported by the bassoons. And then as to the horns, the C horns are playing the dominant uh, and we're getting a big stroke from the timpani playing a G. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> that the timpani is playing the seventh from below. So it's almost like A7 over G. It's like a slash chord. This could just as easily have been an A or a C sharp. You would probably get just about the same effect, but I like the fact that it's G right in there. And it's probably a symptom of having to use this G pitch later on in the piece. And the fact that it was really kind of annoying to retune timpani back in the day. It was possible to do it within a movement like this, but it was just still kind of a hassle. And so just really better to leave that timpani tuned where it was and uh, sort of fit it into the harmony of the rest of the 2D chord. Now here we have silence. So I would say probably GP is what you would read in most scores, general pause. So we have a three bar pause and that is where we'll stop this half of the lecture. And wow, that was so much fun. I really enjoyed talking about that particular passage. So listen for a lot of those things. Some things that I didn't mention is the way that the bassoons are hitting this A over and over again, leading us to the big A seventh chord and how these pitches are echoing the pitches that we're seeing climb higher and higher in the other strings besides the second violins. So it's almost like a slap back echo, right? B flat, B flat. B, B, C, C, C sharp, C sharp, right? Just ba, 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 ba. And that kind of back and forth between the groups is also terrifically exciting. Listen for the way that the relaxation corrects to the next chord down and what that relationship means for previous chords that start off these big climbs. And just the whole drama of things. It's really not a very complex passage, mathematically or in any way, really. It's actually some pretty simple stuff. And I almost feel like this was just an idea that Berlioz had been toying with for a while, and he just stuck it in this movement. Because it doesn't really have an enormous relationship to other things that have been happening. Now, leading up to this, we had some of this ba da 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 kind of stuff happening in the winds. So that could be seen as a development of it. But I think that it's really an expression of pure passion. And yet intellect, the romantic composers tempered their passion with intellect and Berlioz, for all his excesses, was no exception. So have a listen to that, and then I will see you in a couple of screens. And now for the second half of this lecture, I love how third horn just comes in here and plays this very secure note of D sounding down an octave. It's a really great note for third horn because it's in their top octave, so very, very easy to play. But had this same D sounding this D down here, right? been given to the E flat horn, it would have been much less of a secure note because the player would have essentially had to play a written B natural that would have been exposed for the entire orchestra, that there's no other note playing for two and a half bars, right? So the exact intonation would have been a little bit trickier to nail. 
Not to say that a good first player couldn't, but it would be better and easier just to give it to the third, who is kind of like the substitute first, right? The hot shot in training, who will someday move out of the orchestra or take over the first's position when they retire, right? They'll move out and become their own first horn player someday. The first horn player really is a lot like a concert master of their own little world, their horn section, which can get up to like eight horns sometimes even more, in some massive pieces. I really love the sense of quartal motion here, right? The resolution of A7 is D, right? So here we have just a single lone D. And these second violin players, Soli, will be upwardly reaching from the dominant A of... D up to D, right? And then we're going from D to G. And since there's no median here, that's where I hear the kind of quartal harmony. Uh, so Berlioz is trying to get back to G, and he does it in just a kind of a very graceful way, and I feel this is very modern. Berlioz is of questionable influence in the Romantic period. That is to say that his vision and his wild sense of orchestration and his passionate approach to composition and all that other stuff, that was influential. The idea of Berlioz was influential. The freedom that he represented in terms of orchestration was influential. But his techniques, his compositional techniques and his personality as an orchestrator and composer were not necessarily that influential, right? You don't see people trying to be Berlioz. In fact, you see people trying not to be Berlioz. But I really love this. This is almost something that you could have heard in a 20th century piece. So A7 resolving to D, a single D note, the sense of D major hinted at, with these upwardly reaching dominant to tonic kind of gestures. And then right in here, the D really is the dominant of G, where we end up back there, right? We modulated to G from our E day fix at the beginning of the actual start of the symphony after the intro was finished. And in G, we're going to stay for a while. Now, I really love this whole idea D up to G, D down to G in staccato here. It really reminds me so much of a beating heart, the same way that we had this sort of yaga, yaga, yaga kind of happening under the E day fix. So this is Berlioz's heart finding a groove. It's found this rhythm. And what is that rhythm driving? The E day fix, right? And we're hearing that same thing. Bum, 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 da. Instead of it being expressed by flute doubling the first violins. Here it is being expressed as a triple octave. Very simple scoring. One dolce, so softly being played by each first player, first flute, first clarinet in the middle, first bassoonist on the bottom. And it's really a beautiful combination and, and one that's used a lot in the classical period. So this isn't necessarily something that is all that groundbreaking. It's just that it goes on and on and on for page after page. That's what's groundbreaking, once again, is the scope of how Berlioz is enlarging the possibilities. He's also doing it in a way that is so compelling, right? His crazy vision, his crazy creative vision is making all this possible in terms of public taste, right? Which is something that affects orchestration, right? It's not like we can just turn that off and say public taste is impure and is a bad reason for us to do things. And, and I agree with that, by the way. But we can't ignore its pressure on things and how it changes things in positive ways from time to time. You could almost say that public taste was what drove the Stravinsky ballets. They had a winner on their hands, and the imagination of the Parisian public was stirred by Firebird and by the other Russian operas that were brought over by Ballet Russe. 
and then Petrushka also emerged from that same thing. And actually, Rite of Spring was intended to capture that, but the circumstances played against them in the end. But that's a whole other series of score analyses. Anyhow, right here, you can really hear the building of that, you know, tucka 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 that sort of heartbeat kind of pounding as this is expressed very beautifully. And it just continues on. Now, right in here, we see the second clarinetist come in here to double the first bassoon. And we have a very low first flute playing right in here. And so this is where the music telescopes from a triple octave to just a double octave. And that is to help compensate for the weakness of the first flute right in here. But as they start to pull away and get higher and right up into their sweet spot up here on this higher A, then you see the parts changing, right? From reaching upwards all the way up to this A here in the first bassoon, we eventually turn back into a triple octave here with C sharps. Once again, don't forget your B flat clarinet sounding down a whole step, right? So D sharp sounding C sharp. And we're right back where we started in terms of the positions of the melodic units. And notice our strings are just fluttering along down here with the occasional push on the eighth before the downbeat. Okay, now things are going to get a little bit more exciting. So here's where we're getting to that da 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 crescendo poco a poco, and there's going to be a bit of a cello rondo right in here, and the music is going to get a little bit more exciting. We're seeing the collapsing down E flat to A, D to A, and so on, and to these open A's. So just really, once again, as I said before, very simple to play. And the same thing is going on here, just on one string over, E flat going down to an open D, and so on. All really, really simple. And all of these intervals that we're seeing in the violas are really easy to play as double stops. And here we're just seeing the same thing going on with the cellos and the double basses. Okay, so what is going to happen here? Well, our composer is going to add some harmony. So starting off from here, uh, we've got D E flat, C sounds E flat, right? And B sounds D. So this sounds like it's going to be a melody note, but actually it is turning into this harmony here of this E flat just kind of holding all the way through and then relaxing back down to B. So we're seeing how that passionate passage that we just went through at the first half of the lecture is being used later on in the piece. And then right in here, this is just G down an octave going down to F sharp. And that is an octave below this F sharp and so on. I'm, I'm not going to get into the harmonic consequences and everything, but just to show you why the orchestration affects the harmony, and you can work out the harmony yourself. Now, right in here, it's a similar kind of backing harmony. It's not exactly the same kind of a thing. You have E flat and F sharp kind of helping the sense of a diminished chord right in here. Okay, and here it's going from B thirds to C thirds but it's not really the same harmonic position within the context of the harmony is what I'm trying to say. And right in here we have the third bassoon taking the same exact pitches as the C horns, right? This sounding down an octave. So it's the same basic thing, but a different chord that is creating tension in here and then resolution on the next screen. This is really lovely. The first horn emerging, and you can really hear this right in here. G going up to A flat and then kind of holding on that A flat which is interpreted as G sharp by the strings. It's just really lovely. It kind of changes into more of a chorale in terms of the harmony behind it with the 
third bassoon on the bottom there. Just, just such great scoring right in here. So wise. And we're starting to see the strings coming in like just one eighth before the downbeat more and more on their little timekeeping. Now here, because these groups right in here are going to be written out the same as before as whole notes, Berlioz spells out divisi how these chords are going to be apportioned in the violas. So you've got this, you know, right in here. Same thing, he's got a little bracket. I would say the bracket is completely unnecessary. Once the players understand the context that they're going to be covering the top two notes, unless they're going to be trading back and forth over and over again with, say, the next chord, the second group of divisi viola players covering the bottom two notes, then I don't think you really need the bracket. I think the players can understand. We have our triple octave going on, doubling between first oboe and first clarinet player in the middle, first bassoon on the bottom, first flute on top, so it's no longer a two flutes, right? And they're getting more and more support just from the context of how uh, the fluttering is going on in the first violin, with the, just the support on some of those same pitches. And I really love the kind of unique solo feel of first flute on top there, rather than having it doubled a two. I think that that is a much more intimate color and context. So he's setting up the ultimate resolution of the E-Day fix once again. And it's so beautiful right in here, just this little chorale type writing and the way that the oboe rises up here and just becomes the dominant voice here. It, it can't help but do that. And notice the little dashed diminuendo in here. This probably was not intended by Berlioz at all. He wanted the first oboe player to play out and become the new solo top voice. And this is a callback to the passage that was just before our passionate passage we started with in this lecture. And it kind of is tying things together at the end. So notice Berlioz's sense of form, it only marginally relies on things like modulation. The modulation is just basically a framework that's left over and something you're supposed to do. And it's, you know, if anybody in the audience is really paying attention to it, then great, fine for them. But what he's more interested in is the cohesion of emotional logic, of emotional expression, right? He wants things to begin and end and relate to each other, and that's what he's interested in terms of form. He's not really interested in making everything kind of add up and subtract and, yeah, we just saw an example of his mathematical ingenuity, but that's just kind of like a parlor trick. It's sort of like Sudoku, right? It's just a fun idea that he had. It's not applied form in any way. It's not him trying to be perfect according to the dictates of common practice. There's some cool stuff right in here. I'm not going to get into it too much. I just really love the motion right in here of the bassoons, the bit of harmonization, and these isolated notes, once again, using whichever horn has the best sound for that particular note. So in this case, we want to produce a middle C, so he gives it to the third horn. We want to produce D above middle C, so he gives that to the second horn, and then we have the same note here, so we have that kind of echoing, right? That's really kind of a cool idea. Eventually, the third bassoon plays unison with the first, along with the cellos, and follows this lovely downward diving line. So let's stop there, okay?
watch for all of those things. The beautiful choral that sort of emerges for just a bar and a half right in here as we go to Rehearsal X. This callback to our previous lecture, the way that it wrapped up, uh, how the cellos and the bassoons start to really pick up a lot of energy right in here. And also the sort of background fluttering by the strings, right? That is his heart. <laughs> he is putting it on a platter for Harriet and just hoping that she notices him, right? He wrote this entire symphony so that she would notice him and it eventually paid off about, what, three years after it was composed. Watch for certain things, the warmth of the horns right in here, the more important role of the third bassoon underpinning everything and of course those lovely triple octaves and how they're voiced whether it is with oboe in the middle helping out the clarinet the first flute on top and the first bassoon on the bottom or whether it's just bassoons clarinets flutes and so on with a less intimate sound kind of a more open sound Watch for this entrance right in here and think about how the first horn is being used right in here because it's just easier in terms of its transposition to catch the particular pitches that are needed. And then how the C horns are used right in here with much more playable pitches than if that top note was given to the E flat horn. And once again, the third bassoon coming in here echoing what happened with the third horn previously. And here, this little compromise in the middle, where the first flute reaches so low that it goes down to double octaves, and then eventually opens out into triple octaves again. This neat little fixing up work right in here of Berlioz that is just another feature of his mastery to make everything sound so smooth and natural and without interruption, without any instrument being pushed too low or pushed too high. And then, of course, how everything begins with the D reacting to the A seventh and seeming as if it is the resolution, but it is actually just the dominant note of G major and how this all starts to get going. This wonderful engine of his reverie, right? It's back to reverie. We felt the passion of his feelings for Harriet, and now we're back to the reverie of the magic of him experiencing her and wanting to pursue her. So let's stop there, and I will just have you listen to that, and we'll pick up in a day or two with the next lecture for this month, which is just really, really fun, and I think you'll enjoy. So thanks again. Thanks to all the Patreon supporters of this series. I just announced it on Facebook, and there was a big reaction. A lot of people really love this piece, and I feel that this is going to be one of our best, most viewed lecture series ever. So I'll see everybody very soon and thank you to everybody viewers supporters and everyone out there who will eventually come to appreciate Berlioz in the same way as conductors and people who really study this closely I'm really glad to bring all that to the surface for you